Humanity, Chapter 8 by James People and Garrick Bailey. Exchange in Economic Systems. In September 1958, San Francisco-based Bank America mailed small plastic cards to its 60,000 customers in Fresno, California. Those who received the card must have been surprised to see the bank was giving them a $500 line of credit, allowing them to purchase $500 worth of merchandise without paying cash. <clears throat> The bank had previously persuaded around 300 Fresno merchants to accept the cards rather than cash for merchandise. Bank of America would itself would pay the merchants for the purchase, then bill their car hold, cardholder customers for all their purchases in a given month. With its $500 line of credit, in effect, each card was a small loan. This, of course, was the origin of the first general purpose credit card called Bank of Bank AmeriCard. It was not the first credit card. Since 1949, affluent residents of New York City could use the Diners Club card, but only at selected restaurants, particular chain stores like Sears and JCPenney had charge cards that were accepted at their stores, but nowhere else. Before credit cards, people who wanted to make expensive purchases that they could not afford them afford from their wages or salaries either had to save up or go to a bank fill out a form and persuade the bank to approve a loan for household goods like refrigerators tv sets and new furniture with the bank america card cardholders received revolving credit in which they did not have to pay their entire bill within a specific time period but could pay whenever they wished, as long as they did not exceed their limit. However, late payments did carry interest charges, which over the years increased greatly. The bank expected to make more, make most of its money from small transaction fees. It charged merchants and merchants expected to make more, make money as more people became customers and spent more at their stores. Eventually, Banks and merchants were proved, <clears throat> sorry, I'm so shaky, correct, but at first the bank lost money with the Bank AmeriCard. Some stores did not accept the card, preferring to avoid transaction fees, and because in the beginning the cards were sent out indiscriminately, there were no credit scores in those days. About one out of four cardholders did not pay their bills. Some cards were preferred pilfered, including out of mailboxes, so fraud was widespread. Soon the bank began mailing applications for cards rather than actual cards, allowing it to select which re recipients qualified. Additional banks began offering the card, and in 1976, the bank changed the name of the card to Visa, a term that was chosen because it connotated acceptance. By then, there were many competing California banks that associated together and issued a card called Master Charge. Now, MasterCard. Credit cards are a recent form of exchange in economic systems and have some consequences most people do not think about. We shall discuss, as we shall discuss, this chapter describes the main forms of exchange that have existed historically and cross-culturally and some of their social and economic effects. We also discuss changes in exchanges that helped create the modern world. Economic systems. The word economics has many meanings, but here we use it its everyday one. Economics is how people make their living by satisfying their needs and wants. At a societal level, the three processes are involved in making a living. First, people work and use technology to transform nature's resources into useful products. In modern post-industrial economies, most people in their roles as employees do not produce any tangible <clears throat> material product but work in services. For example, they produce or process 
or transmit information, post blogs, nurse or doctor their patients, wait on restaurant diners, manage the activities of others, and so forth. Service industry workers do not produce any material pr products with their own labor, but their jobs allow them to earn money that satisfies their own material wants and needs. Second, someone consumes the products. We consume material products by eating them, living, the, living in them, driving them, wearing them, and so forth. Many material products are valued for their practical use. Food nourishes, houses, shelter, motor vehicles, transport, and clothes cover. In addition to their material usefulness, many products are also are valued symbolically. For example, in addition to their practical value, food choices may express identity, houses demonstrate wealth, motor vehicles display income, and may earn status, clothes, flatter. These products send social messages about who we are as well as satisfying material needs and wants. Many products and services are brought largely or entirely for their symbolic significance, such as jewelry, cosmetic, haircuts, tattoos, and sometimes club and fitness center memberships. Third, between the time they are produced and consumed, many material products are exchanged in economies, like those of foragers and horticulturalists. Often the producers and the consumers are the same people, usually family members, but nonetheless, exchange exists in these and all econ economies in modern market economies. The producers and the consumers are nearly always different, pe different people or groups. So practically every product is exchanged before it is consumed. Most people make their living by working for firms or public agencies in exchange for money <clears throat> exchange for money in which wages salaries tips commissions and like which they then use to buy goods and services here's the vocabulary word sorry about that <clears throat> in industrial market economies nearly all products are produced entirely for sale once the value money acquired from, mar from the market exchange has been gained, the companies or persons who produce and sell the product have little for further interest in it, except in the, except insofar as its quality affects future sales or reputation. However, markets are only one way to organize exchange in substance-based economies, families, or other kinds of kinship groups produce mainly be for their own needs, not for sale on the market, and rather than exchanges based on supply, demand, and prices, exchanges or are organized around the other principles. Anthropologists usually classify forms of exchange into three major modes or types, reciprocity, in which individuals or groups pass products back and forth with the aim of helping someone in need by sharing with him or her, creating, maintain, maintaining or strengthening social relationships or obtaining products made by others for oneself. Redistribution, in which the members of an organized group contribute products or money to a common pool or fund that is divided, reallocated, among the group as a whole by central authority market in which products are produced and sold for money which in turn is used to purchase other products other with the with the ultimate goal of acquiring more money that can be spent on more products or saved or invested the concept review illustrates the three forms of exchange notice the key differences with reciprocal Re I'll just set that word too. Reciprocity. Generally speaking, products pass between individuals who already know one another or wish to establish or strengthen a relationship. With redistribution, people who contribute to a central pool 
or fund may or may not have relationships with one another, but all have relationship to the authorities who collect and reallocate with markets. No party needs to know any of the others outside of the context of the exchange itself. With a few qualifications, market transactions are impersonal and one person's money is worth the same as anyone else's. Most products, including land and labor, are exchanged through the market mode in modern industrial economies, but reciprocity and redistribution also exist. Examples of reciprocity are various gifts we give, receive on holidays, birthdays, weddings, baby showers, and other cultural culturally special occasions, if you are employed every pay period, you participate in redistribution because federal, state, and local government collect a portion of your wage or salary as taxes. They spend these public monies on public purposes like wars or roads or transfer money to other members of society, like the elderly, the poor, and subsidies for corporations and farmers. All, of, all these exchange forms thus exist in modern societies, so, but not all pre-industrial peoples have all three. Reciprocity in one form or another occurs in all human populations, but redistribution implies a central leader whose role carries authority to organize the collection of resources from a group and to make decisions about how they will be re reallocated. Redistribution, therefore, is an insignificant exchange mode in societies that lack strong leaders who make decisions on behalf of the group. The market mode of exchange requires many private property and certain other features that are absent in non-market economies. Here is the concept review. Should you wish to write this one? Excuse me. Reciprocity. In substance oriented economies such as those based on foraging, horticultural, or and pastoralism, most families and households are capable of producing most of the food and other products they consume. That is, most families are potentially self sufficient in the sense that they have they own or have access to the land, labor, tools, and other resources necessary for survival. However, no one, no known society or families, households, or other kinds of social groups self-sufficient, in fact. Everywhere, such groups exchange products with other groups. Most anthropologists say this is because families and other groups need or want to maintain relationships with other families and groups. And exchange is necessary to create and sustain these relationships. For one thing, most groups need help from time to time, so they need to keep up relationships with others to increase their long-term economic security. Other reasons include acquiring spouses, maintaining political ties, strengthening military alliances, and gaining new social contacts. The form of exchange used for such purposes is reciprocity, defined as the transaction of objects without the use of money or other media of exchange. Reciprocity takes several forms, including sharing with those in need, providing hospitality, giving gifts, engaging in mutual feasting, and bartering. Various forms are motivated by different considerations and values. So anthropologists distinguish three forms of reciprocity, generalized, balanced, and negative. Generalized reciprocity, the defining feature of generalized reciprocity is that those who give objects do not expect the re recipient to make a return at any definite time in the future. Here's the vocabulary word. Generalized reciprocity occurs between individuals who are at least normatively expected to be emotionally attached to one another and therefore have no an obligation to help one another on the basis of relative need. 
parents who provide their children with the shelter, food, vehicles, and colleges, educations, are practicing generalized reciprocity that sustains younger generations giving without expectation of definite, of de def yeah, definite return also should occur between parties to certain other kinds of social relationships, such as wives and husbands, siblings, and sometimes close friends. Other familiar forms including include donating objects to Goodwill and Salvation Army and giving money to United Way or your alma mater. However, in these latter cases, the possibility of taking tax deductions for your gift complicates the concept of generalized reciprocity. Here is the vocabulary term. Because it includes various forms of sharing with relatives and other people, culturally defined as close, generalized reciprocity is found in all societies. However, among some peoples, it is the dominant form of exchange, meaning that, it, that more resources are distributed using this form than any other form. For example, most hun hunter-gatherers expect their bandmates to share food and be generous with their possessions partly because most members of a band are just relatives of some kind. See chapter 7. Among the Jew Hyansi, the band is a social group within which food sharing is culturally expected or even mandatory. Those who are stingy with possessions or who fail to share food with others are ridiculed or socially punished in some way, some other way. Generalized reciprocity ensures an equitable, if not entirely equal, distribution of food among the band's families. Balanced reciprocity. In balanced reciprocity, products are transferred to the recipient and the donor expects a return in products of roughly equal value. Over the long run, the value of the products exchange should be approximately equivalent. The return may be expected soon or whenever the donor demands it, or by some specified time in the future. With the ba with balanced reciprocity, the giver tries to apply some kind of sanction against the receiver if the latter does not re reciprocate within the appropriate time period. Donors may become angry if there is no reciprocation or may complain or gossip to others may try to force a return or may suspend all relations until all until things of appropriate value are returned although the value of the objects exchange is is supposed to be about equal balance reciprocity is characterized by the absence of bargaining between the parties in some pre-industrial economies the exchange of objects without having to negotiate with, for each transaction frequently is organized by a special relationship between two individuals known as trade partnership. Individuals one of one tribe or a village pair off with specific individuals, their partners from other regions, with whom they establish long-lasting trade relationships. For instance, in the Trobriand Islands, off the eastern tip of New Guinea, there was a form of balanced reciproc reciprocity called Wasi. Residents of coastal villages traded fish for yams and other garden crops produced in the mountainous interior. The exchange was formalized. A coastal vil village paired off with an interior village, and within each village, individuals formed trade partnerships. The rates of exchange between the garden produ produce and the fish were established by custom, so there was no haggling at any particular transaction. In Wasi, each trade partner received foods not readily available locally, so parties to the transaction gained a material benefit. In other cases, trade partnerships have social as well as material benefits. For example, the Joe Huansi have a gift exchange custom called Hexaro. In Hexaro, the, ex the gift exchange is delayed. Those who receive an object 
are not expected to return anything for an indefinite and often long period of time. Huaxi partners rely on one another for mutual support in other contexts, such as when one partner asks to forage in the territory of another. The social relationship created and reinforced by Hiexu matters more to people than the objects given and received. In Hiexu, gifts make friends and vice versa, illustrating that gifts have symbolic value. More generally, when pe two people exchange gift I ex excuse me, exchange gifts, ideally both gain something more than the sum total of the economic worth of the objects. On your friend's birthday, instead of giving him, giving her earrings, <clears throat> in exchange for a gift of about equal value on your own birthday, you both could save the cost of wrapping paper and cards by buying the objects yourself. However, neither of you would gain the symbolic value added when the exchange of objects becomes an exchange of gifts on culturally appropriate occasions. As material symbols of good relations, gifts both create and sustain feelings of solidarity and relations of mutual aid between individuals and groups. Gifts show that the giver has expended some resources and taken some trouble because she or he cares about the recipient. Perhaps this is one reason why so many people prefer not to receive cash or gift cards. They take too little effort, are too generic to be personal, and the nature of the gift does not express the character of the relationship. To many people, gifts of cash or cards dilute the symbolic value of the gift. Gift exchange communicates warm feelings, perhaps even better than words, both because talk is cheap and because some of us never know the right words to say. Conversely, failure to present objects of this socially appropriate value also can communicate feelings, although less warm ones. On the other hand, gifts are used to obligate people from whom the giver wants something. Receiving gifts tends to make someone feel indebted and therefore can be used to create an obligation to return a favor. If not a material object, political lobbyists and sales representatives know that contributions and gifts can serve one's self-interest. Among many pre-industrial peoples, balanced recipro reciprocity takes the form of mutual exchanges and or of gifts or invitations for political purposes. The, the Maring are horticultural people of the mountainous interior of Papua New Guinea. In the 1960s, when Roy Rapoport worked among them, the Maring lived in settlements composed of clusters of kin groups. Each settlement was periodically at war with some of its neighbors and formed political alliances with other neighbors. When warfare occurred, the warriors of each settlement relied on their allies for military support and, in the case of defeat, for refuge. To express continued goodwill, every few years, whenever they accumulated enough pigs, the members of a settlement invited their allies to an enormous feast appropriately called a pig feast. At the pig feast, which was intended by hundreds of people, allies brought large quantities of wealth objects to exchange and pay off debts. They consumed enormous quantities of pork provided by their host. They were on the lookout for potential spouses and sexual partners, and they aided in the host settlement in the ceremonial dancing that the Maring believed ritually necessary for success in the fighting that would soon occur. The host group also used their pig feast to gouge the amount of military support they could expect from their allies. The more people who attended the feast, the more warriors the host settlement could be could put on the battleground. Later, the guests ac accumulated enough pigs to reciprocate by hosting a pig feast of their own. Reciprocal feasting was essential to the military success and he continued survival of a marrying community here. Here and among many other peoples, the back and forth flow of products 
invitations and returned invitations and other forms of give and take are essential for well-being and sometimes military survival. In the contemporary world, two balanced reciprocal re, recipro, I can't talk today. Reciprocity in the foreign form of foreign aid creates and sustains relationships between communities. In this example, between nations in anthropological jargon, foreign aid seems like more of an example of generalized reciprocity conducted on a massive scale. However, to the extent that it influences relationships between donors and recipients, it is more than an aid. American aid promotes political stability in another country, Iraq, maintains potential sites for military operations. Here's the negative for the vocabulary word. Pakistan and assists allies in warding off perceived or actual enemies, Israel, South Korea. Moreover, foreign aid is relatively cheap way to look out for the interests of one's own nation, requiring less than 1% of the federal budget. Negative reciprocity. In negative reciprocity, both parties attempt to gain all they can from the exchange while giving up as little as possible. Negative reciprocity is usually motivated largely by the desire to obtain material goods at minimum costs. Insofar as it is motivated by the desire for material goods, negative reciprocity is like market exchange. It is different mainly because no money changes hands. In economies with no money, negative reciprocity is an important way for individuals and groups to acquire products that they do not produce themselves. Few communities are entirely self-sufficient. Some foods the community likes to eat may not be found where the people live. Some materials the group needs to make tools may not be found locally and the people in the group may lack the skills needed to produce some of the objects they use. To acquire these things, people produce other goods to exchange for imports. Barter is the most common form of negative reciprocity. In the interior highlands of Papua New Guinea, many indigenous peoples manufactured many or wealth objects by stringing shells together into long chains or belts. Because these shells did not occur naturally in the interior, they were traded from people to people until they reached their final destination. Salt was also in, also a trade object because it was found it found in only a few areas. Similarly, in western North America, the obsidian volcanic glass used to make stone tools was found in only a few areas. Other peoples acquired it through trade. In some cases, these trade routes stretched for hundreds of miles with the obsidian passing through the hands of numerous middlemen before finally being made into a tool. Reciprocity and social distance. Each type of reciprocity tends to be associated with a certain kinds of social relationship. Marshall Salins first distinguished the three varieties back in 1965. He noted that the form of the reciprocity that occurs between individuals or groups depends on social distance between them. Social distance is at the degree to which cultural norms specify persons should be intimate with or emotionally attached to one another. A given mode of reciproc reciprocal Exchange is normally appropriate only with certain kinds of social relationships. North American social norms illustrate the idea. We expect people to practice generalized reciprocity with children and perhaps with siblings and elderly parents. Others may judge those who refuse to offer help to help family members as uncaring or selfish. Well-off grandparents may help with the grandkids' higher education with cars, or with down payments on a house. But middle-income persons who repeatedly give or lend money 
to a deadbeat cousin might be seen as foolish. As our social relationships with other people change, so does the kind of reciprocity we pr practice with them. As we mature, we go from being the recipients of generalized reciprocity to a more balanced reciprocity. As we become more independent near the end of our parents' lives, most of us provide generalized reciprocity. For most parents need or appreciate the assistance of children in spite of government aid and by Social Security and Medicare, finally changing one form of reciprocity into another can be a way of changing the nature of social relationship because the form of reciprocity to people is related to the degree of social distance between them. One party can increase or decrease the social distance by initiating a new form of exchange, or someone can signal his or her wish to draw another person closer by tentatively initiating a relationship of balanced reciprocity. If we work, if we are work colleagues, I can let you know that I want to become friendlier by giving you an unexpected gift or inviting you to dinner. In turn, you let me know when, whether you share my thought, my feelings by returning my gift on an appropriate occasion or repeatedly finding reasons to refuse my dinner invitation or coming to dinner several times at my place without recipro recipe. I can't say that word today. Reciprocating. If we both use this strategy of reciprocity, neither of us needs to put in the potentially embarrassing position of verbalizing our feelings. I signal my wish by my initial gift or invitation, and you decline or accept my offer of friendship by your response. Here again, reciprocity is symbolic conveying messages about ideal re social relationships, hoped for relationships, and even rejected relationships because we routinely re use reciprocity as a way of conveying feelings and sending social messages. Anthropologists commonly view reciprocal exchanges as a form of communication. I'm going to go ahead and this will be the end of part one on chapter four or I'm sorry, chapter eight.